Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1, and we're just going to read through the whole chapter. Let's all stand and read. Come on, you'll get comfortable in a minute. Ready? This is from the NIV. Then I saw on the right hand of Him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, and circled by the four living creatures and the elders. And he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding seven bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe. Keep going, those of you who have a Bible. Where are we? What verse? Verse 9. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. You may be seated. It struck me that the whole purpose of the revelation of Jesus Christ is to give every single one of us a divine encounter with the real Jesus. After all, it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. Some of your Bibles, if, if it's a King James or maybe an older Bible, will say the apocalypse. What does that mean? Because when we think of the word apocalypse, what do we think of? End of the world, Tim LaHaye, left behind, black helicopters, <laughs> nuclear bombs. But it doesn't mean that. Apocalypse means unveiling. Now don't get me wrong, you know, I... I'm not saying that those things won't happen and they, we see some of those things happening. It may, the day may come. But the purpose of revelation is so that we can have an encounter with the real Jesus in our life in a personal way. This book, if we approach it the way that it was meant to be approached, will strip away all the dusty cobwebs of time and bring Jesus into our life. This, you know, chapter 5 is really at the, the pinnacle of the book. And I think it's fitting that we remain there for at least one Sunday. I had in the program that I was going to go into chapter 6 today. That's not true. I'm not going to take you there. But let me just give you a little sneak peek of next week. Because in chapter 6, you have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. 
And usually when you hear sermons on chapter 6, and you hear about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, it's preached in the context of a coming judgment upon the world. I'll just give you a sneak peek. That's not the view that I take. I believe that the four horsemen have already been trotting out really since Jesus' day. More on that in the future. Each of these books, by the way, it's really interesting as we go into the next few chapters, will take us right up until the end. And so the book of Revelation is like a, an unfolding, you know, increasing revelation. And many times it's talking about the same historical context. I'll explain more. But going back to this, Jesus took the scroll in chapter 5. Now remember what we said the scroll was? What is the scroll? It's, it's the will of God for humanity, but it's also the story of humanity. And it's written in the front and the back, which was unusual for a scroll. And the idea here is that there's a lot written in it. And it includes your story and mine. Remember, John wept when he, when he saw at first that no one could open it. Why would, he, why would John cry? John was weeping because John was thinking about all the churches, the Christians that were suffering terrible persecution. And he knew that that scroll, that the significance of that scroll would mean something to every one of those real Christians that he oversaw and that he pastored. And even his own life. And so the scroll is God's Word. And I'm not just talking about the canonical books of the Bible. It's the history of salvation, our history, and the way that God is moving to redeem all of it. We talked about two weeks ago that Jesus, as He opens the scroll, as the Word of God, you know, we, I'll, I'll repeat this again for the sake of those who weren't. Logos means in a nutshell, reason. And so when, when we have an apocalyptic revelation of Jesus, when Jesus is unveiled in our life, He takes everything that we are. This is the essence of salvation. It's an encounter with Jesus that brings meaning into, into our life. And I'm going to end just with a personal illustration uh, just to let you know about how that worked in my life. So this book was was intended and inspired by God so that those who were not there 2,000 years ago, those of us who were not eyewitnesses, could have a powerful revelation and a realization, an encounter with Jesus. I mean, you know, even John, who had walked with Jesus and, and had seen Him you know, work wonders, had been a disciple of Jesus, was by His side, even John was blown away by his encounter with Jesus. By the way, that's the essence of the word holy. When the angels and the, and the saints and the elders, they cry, holy, holy, holy. How do you put this in a way that means something to us? Because it can become one of those sort of meaningless words that we say a lot but really has no depth. When we say God is holy, it means that, it, it, it just means that it's just, it's an overwhelmingly surprising, wonderful revelation of God. And over and over and over you see that word in, in the book of Revelation. So, let me just bring this down to where the rubber meets the road. We all need, in our life, an apocalyptic unveiling of Jesus. And that was the purpose of this book. And an apocalypse is intended to make the reader go, Oh! Now I see who this guy is. I see who this Jesus is. And I can make sense of my life. Now I see the purpose of my struggles and my failures and my sin and all of these rabbit trails in my life that seem to go nowhere. And I see the purpose of the hurts and the letdowns. I see it. And I experience it. You know, forget about what the unbelieving scholars in Newsweek have done to this book in causing us to doubt it. 
Let's just talk about the way evangelicals handle this book. You know what? I'll know what an evangelical is, right? We kind of are one. Now, in the vineyard, we kind of tend to say that we, we, believe, we believe ourselves to be empowered evangelicals, and that's just kind of like a nice term that says that we believe that the gifts didn't end in the first century, and that we believe that we can experience the power of God. You know, most vineyard theologians don't like to call themselves Pentecostals. I don't have any problem with it. I like Pentecostals. Pentecostalism, and we were reminded again by missiologists who spoke to us at our pastoral gatherings, while we're kind of trying to, you know, mince words and see what works and play with all of our U.S. spirituality and everything, Pentecostals are leading the world to Christ in the third world, or whatever the terminology now for the third world. There's a nice politically correct terminology now. The emerging world. So what, what modern evangelical scholarship, if you, pick, go to the, you know, if you go to a Christian bookstore and you go to buy a commentary on the book of Revelation to help you understand it, about 90% of it, 90% of those scholars will take the book of Revelation and throw it into some nebulous future that's about to happen. And that's okay. I believe that this book is significant for the future. I, 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 I accept some of those the, the views. But that wasn't the intention of John, I don't believe. Not denying any future significance. I'm not a, for those of you who understand the, the theological nuance, I'm not a preterist. I don't believe that everything in the book of Revelation has already happened. I'm not that. I, I don't know what I am. I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm a sort of a hybrid. But this book was intended to bring meaning and transformation to a believer at every stage of human history. You know, one, one guy who is a, a well-known social critic, he's also a, a Roman Catholic priest. His name is Ivan Illich. Uh, he was asked, what's the quickest way to change a society? How do you do it? How do you change society? Do you do it by revolution, by, you know, armed uprising? Do you, do you do it by education? Do you do it by indoctrination? And his answer was none of those things. That if you really wanted long-term change, what you need to do is tell an alternative story that is so compelling that it will draw others to the story. This is the whole purpose of the book of Revelation. It's a story that is so compelling that it draws everything to it. By the way, this is the essence of the gospel. Jesus is the greatest story ever told. Remember, the, remember that movie back in the 60s? The greatest story ever told. If you're a, a scholar, you studied sociology, these so-called postmodernist sociologists, they say that Jesus, they would, they would call Jesus, they would call the gospel a meta-narrative, the big story. And it's a story that's big enough to encompass every other story. You know, what does it mean? This goes to the heart of what it means to come to Christ. What does it mean to receive Jesus? What does it mean to get saved? It means this. It means that His story, His preaching, His teaching of the kingdom, the doing of the kingdom works, His suffering, His death, resurrection, becomes our story too. We really are grafted into His story. This is the essence of the gospel. It's a story that has power to transform. This is why, you know, a few weeks ago, we tried to memorize the significant aspects of that story when we did the, the meeting with um, James Abraham. And whether you tell it the way James Abraham does or not, we need to tell it. You know, Paul dealt with a lot of doubts too, I'm sure. He was trying to convince the Romans to believe a story about a Jewish carpenter. You know, that's what? About a thousand miles away from where Rome is, Jerusalem, from, Jer from Jerusalem to Rome. How, that, that, back then it was most of the known world. And he was trying to tell them that what this 
insignificant, little-known Jewish carpenter, what he did 20 years ago was relevant to them. That it would have some kind of significance. Now in Rome, they'd heard everything. In Rome, they had seen, they had seen everything. Every false religion, every false messiah, every cult, every religious thing had come to Rome. Paul must have had an occasional faith crisis. Paul must have gotten up some mornings. One of those mornings, you know, he talked about being faithful when everything was going well, when he was experiencing abundance, or when he was in scarcity and lacking things. And he must have wondered, you know, where the money was going to come for his ministry. And, and how he was going to be able to fulfill the calling of God in his life. He must have gotten up from time to time asking himself if it was all worth it. Taking all of this heat, all of this persecution, which was everywhere. But one thing compelled Paul. It was the story that he had to tell. It was the story of Jesus. Look what he says in Romans 14. If you could put that... Is this thing working? Romans 14... Chapter 1, verse 14 rather. He says, I am obligated to both Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel, the good news, also to you who are at Rome. Why? He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And I think I have one more, the verse 17. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the, ju- the righteous shall live by faith. Here's a story, the gospel story, that when it's believed by faith, when it's received by faith, it brings salvation. Now that word salvation means a lot more than just an initial experience of being born again. At the core of that word, soteria, it means a transformation of life. It means that we become like Him. It means that we take on His identity. That His life is our life. That we are His body. That His scroll is our scroll because it belongs to Him. Hang on with me for a moment. Because I just what I want to do, and my purpose this morning, is not to go back everything over everything that we went back, we covered two weeks ago, but just to give you an idea of the significance of this chapter and of this book. Because we can't let it go easily. Paul said to live was Christ. To die was gain. Right? To live is Christ. He didn't say... To live is to read about Christ. Or to live is to know some things about Christ. He says to live is Christ. Now Peter Hyatt, you know, whose book I've talked about a lot, said this. Listen, your life is a storybook in the strong right hand of God Almighty as He sits on the throne. God the Son has taken hold of the scroll and is beginning to read that book to you. Your story. And then he says, Child of God, you are waking up to the glories of the great lion of the tribe of Judah, Son of God. Behold that lion. He is the lamb slain for love, working everywhere in this world. What did he mean by that? Basically, it, it, it's this. The lion gives meaning to your past. He gives meaning to your present. And he gives hope for the future. Who was, who is, who is to come. God is the God of the whole package. Look at Philippians uh, 3.13. A verse that we're very familiar with, often misunderstood. Paul said, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward 
what is ahead. Paul says, I forget what lies behind. Now, he didn't mean to forget past events. That's not what he means by this. I remember once talking to a, a guy about you know, going to counseling because he had all these issues in his life. And he said, no, no, no. We're supposed to forget about all of that. Paul said, and he quoted me this verse. That's not what Paul meant by that. He didn't say, forget past events. You can't really do that. As a matter of fact, Paul had just related all these past events. If you read that chapter, talked about what he, what he, what he, what he forgot was the real meaning here. Paul had just listed all of those events. What, what Paul is saying is they no longer, for him, mean shame. Because the Lamb had taken that story and he had rewritten, he had opened it up, and he had given it glory and wonder. And now his, Paul's past and his failings and all of the things that he had gone through, they now meant glory and wonder. Because the Lamb changes the meaning of your presence. Of your present, rather. He, he changes it from confusion to wonder and obedient faith. And the lion changes the meaning of your future from anxiety to hope. Let me finish with this. I just want to tell you about my own story. Just to give you an illustration of how this works. On December the 5th, 1975, I was 20 years old. I was arrested that day for petty theft. And I felt petty. I'd never gotten in any kind of trouble like that before. And I remember, the one thing I remember is I was so ashamed. And the police officers at the Parker Center in downtown Los Angeles went out of their way to make me feel ashamed. They put me in this little cell. I never called anyone. I was so ashamed. I never called a friend. I didn't call my family. I didn't call anybody. I didn't want anybody to know where I was because of the shame that I felt. I felt like a loser. I felt like a complete failure. And as I sat in that cell, they left me there for about three hours. And about three o'clock in the morning, I was released. And I remember walking from downtown Parker Center to where my car was parked. And all of these thoughts going through my mind of how I just ruined my life. I could never, to this day, my parents don't know this story. Now the lamb... Open, when he opened the scroll to my life, sometime late January of 1977, he gave meaning to this event. He redeemed this event. And I'll tell you why. If I had not been arrested that day, I would have continued working for the May Company in downtown Los Angeles. I love that job. I would have continued with my partying. I was making good money. It allowed me to buy drugs. I was a happy hedonist. I would have continued going to the, you know, to the community college and, and feeling wonderful about being smarter than everybody else there. But that day, that day, I felt so ashamed. Now the Lamb who, is, who was and who is and who is to come is not limited by time. He transcends time. And I don't know how this works. But he reached into my past two years later and he gave this meaning. Because all of a sudden, when I received Christ at the corner of, of somewhere in, in West Los Angeles near Wilshire and Westwood Boulevard, I accepted Jesus into my life. It all of a sudden dawned on me, if I hadn't quit that job, and if I hadn't taken on, I remember after being fired from, because I stole something at the place where I was working. I stole a t-shirt. I had $250 in my pocket in cash. And I stole a t-shirt. You imagine how that made me feel. Not only shameful, but like a, what an idiot. What kind of moron does something like this? Answer me. <laughs> so I never told my parents, and I got another job, and I got a job, it was at a plastics molding company, where I sat there and I went like this, taking these little pieces. Sometimes my hand would get caught in, you know, I was just sometimes, you know, bandaged up. I hated that job. I was breathing these fumes. But listen, it was that. God used that to say, you need to do something more. Yes, yes, I'll become a doctor. Dr. Ralph. 
Marcus Welby, MD, that's me. And I thought I was going to UCLA, but the Lamb had a better story. And I, I enrolled at the University of, Southern, of, 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 of California at Los Angeles, and I was, gonna, I was a straight-A student, magna cum laude at East Los Angeles College, baby. And I was going to go take UCLA by storm. Oh, Lord. Failure after failure. I, I remember getting those quizzes. I'm so ashamed. So dumb. I'm never going to be a doctor. Why did I, what is this? There was a young man in that class that became my friend and eventually led me to Christ. And unless I had been arrested on December 5th, 1975, I wouldn't have applied to UCLA and been accepted in time to have been in the same classroom as this young man who was like a bull. He was like the Lion of Judah in my life. He was a lion, but a lamb. You see, Jesus broke into my life as lion and lamb. And this guy would invite me and invite me to Bible studies, and I would say no, and I would laugh at him, and, uh, but I loved him so much, I couldn't say no to him. He was a Jewish believer. I said, no, I'm a Catholic. I'm already there. What are you telling me about Jesus? I know about Jesus. It doesn't work. People go there, and they fall asleep. And, and then let me tell you about Christians, man, those priests that at that school. I don't want to know anything about... But I couldn't get this guy out of my life. He was so nice and relentless. And after eight months, I said, okay, I'll come to the Bible study. I ran out of excuses. And I called, I called my girlfriend. I had a date that night. I said, I'm not coming because I'm going to a Bible study. I had to pull the phone away because the laughter... You going to buy? Are you going to have your lid in your pocket? That's what they used to call a roll of. I don't know what they call it nowadays. The Lamb gave meaning. He opened the scroll of my life. I don't think there would have been any other way for me to come to Jesus. And so He took something that was shameful. And now I look at December fifth, nineteen seventy-five, as a glorious day in my life. Not because it was fun and wonderful, but because He redeemed that date forever. And you know, just a few decades after that, I had a child born on that day. My son David was born on December 5th. The Lamb can be, can give you meaning. He can transform. He can make your life something for the glory of God. I wondered... While I was at UCLA, there was a moment in my life where you know, I entered the ministry and I went to Bible school. And you know, there, were some, some, there, was, there were some issues in the church that I was a part of. The, the guy who was the leader of the, he was the, the senior leader and I was on staff. There were about 15, 20 pastors in this church and this guy had moral failures and ethical failures. And I went through this season in my life where I had to quit there. I was... That's all I knew. I had given my life to Jesus. All of it. I had walked away from medical school. My parents thought I was a fool. My friends thought I was an idiot. Even the guy that had led me to Christ was against it. And I thought they were right. And, and, and this doesn't make sense. This story just kind of fell apart. The movie went wrong somewhere. The, somebody's got to rewrite this script. Well, somebody did. And his name is Jesus. And as I found myself, you know, at age 26, unemployed, an unemployed pastor of an inner city church. During that season, I was wondering, why did I go to this trade technical school for four years to learn how to become a metallurgical technician? What was the meaning of that, God? And by the way, couldn't you have put me in a church? Like, couldn't Charles Swindoll have been my pastor? Instead of Robert Leslie Heimers, Jr. Why couldn't have I had a nice person for a pastor? But the Lamb even brought glory to that story. And it just, after, as I was unemployed and looking for jobs, and I'm not giving you all the details, I couldn't possibly do it. 
I opened the newspaper one day, the Los Angeles Times, and I'm looking for work. Kathy and I had just been married. I see a little ad about this big, and it said, wanted. I don't think there's ever been another ad like this in the history of the Los Angeles Times. <laughs> Sales engineer, minimum requirement, associate in science, metallurgical technology. I don't even think there's any more steel mills in the United States anymore. I didn't think there were any in Los Angeles. And so I called this, this is, that's me, yes. And I called this and, you know, I was so, they, they said, you went to Don Bosco Technical Institute in Rosemead? Yeah. I didn't think anybody cared. I didn't think anybody knew that that place existed. They said, I've heard great things about that school and it, would you come and, and, and interview right away? And long story short, the next day they're, they're flying me to Chicago and I've got this job, this real job with credit cards and expense accounts and, <laughs> and thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you see what happens when you bow before the Lamb. The worst failures can become your greatest victories. It also... It's helpful to have a sidekick like a wife that really <laughs> never loses faith. And off we go. If I had not been fired, if I had not left that church, if those things had not happened, we would not have been spent eight years in Venezuela where God used us to build a church, to plant a church that's still there with about 400 souls that have come to Christ. There wouldn't have other, and hundreds of others that, that met us and, and were impressed with my wife's spirituality. <laughs> they still want her to come. I don't get too many invitations. But the lamb, you see, let me go back and read Peter Hyatt again. <laughs> Here, speak into that mic so it can get recorded. This better be good. He's always building me up. And it, I mean, you know, I received that in Jesus' name. But, <laughs> but the thing that, that like, we're talking about redemption and redeeming, the thing that you guys don't see in the picture of the story that he's telling right now is how incredible incredibly, incredibly shy I was and afraid of people. And so this outgoing Cuban charismatic man <laughs> brought people into my sphere because I would have never gone. I would have never met all the people I've met in my life and all the people that have touched our lives have touched because I was so, you know, my background just made me massively insecure and afraid. And so, matter of fact, when we, when we moved to Venezuela, I'm in the American. He's Cuban. He speaks Spanish. But I'm, I'm the American. I don't speak the language. And so, I mean, some of the people were offended at me because they thought I was stuck up. <laughs> they didn't know I was just afraid of them. I was just afraid. So, so the, the thing is, is being married to him has changed me because I am not a shy person anymore. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> No, nobody will accuse you of that. <laughs> the lamb will open the seals. Those, nobody else can open those seals. Nobody else can take your story and redeem it for the glory of God like Jesus can. I'm not saying every single thing will make sense right away. Sometimes it'll be years before you understand why God permitted that in my life? Why did he allow that pain? There's things that I can relate to about people in their brokenness because of my own brokenness, because of my own addictions, because of these hurts in my life. The Lamb can open those seals. And this is the purpose of this book. It's so that we can bow before him, before the King, 
and ask him, take my scroll and open it. I want to read Peter Hyatt's quote again because it, in light of my story, it'll make sense again. Your life is a storybook in the strong right hand of God Almighty as he sits on the throne. And God the Son has taken hold of the scroll and is beginning to read that book to you. But he's giving it a better ending. Your story, child of God, you are waking up to the glories of the great lion of the tribe of Judah, son of God. Behold that lion. He is a lamb slain for love, working everywhere in this world. What is your story this morning? You know, when we read chapter 5, we see that redemption occurs as Jesus opens the seals that nobody else can open. Only Jesus can do it because He's lion and lamb, not either or. Your story in His hands brings glory to God as you bow before the King. Look how this book ends. If you could bring up those verses in Revelation 5. After he opens the seals, and, and after that wonderful declaration in verse 9, you are worthy because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. This is you. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands. And 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. To receive power. See, He has power to open the seals of your life. To bring glory. He has everything He needs. He has wealth. He has wisdom. He has strength. He has honor. He has all the glory. And all the praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshipped. This is the only response to what Jesus is doing. What is He doing right now? He's reigning. Why is He reigning? To make your story His story. And through your story to bring glory to the Father who sits